Hey there. Welcome to a new series, Underrated Classics. This is where I look at movies that I think are severely underappreciated and need another look. And you may have not even heard of these movies, and if you have, you may have not seen them yet. So, the first one I'm going to start with is one of my absolute favorite films of all time that I first caught late night on cable as a teenager. After I first saw it, I became very obsessed with it and have watched it since probably a dozen times, maybe even more than that. And it's probably become my favorite film by the director who I'm a huge fan of. Oliver Stone's 1988 Talk Radio. Now, Talk Radio is actually based off a play and uh, a book, too, um, that, that had to do with a radio DJ who I think lived in Denver named Alan Berg, who was murdered. Um, Eric Bogosian, who I'm a huge, huge fan of, huge fan of, who did a lot of one-man shows and uh, a lot of performance pieces and, and just just was a huge stage nerd. Um, he, he did the play, and the play was the play was very successful. It was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And the play still performed all over the world today and still very popular. Um, this, was, this was his big breakout as an actor, as a performer. And uh, the material doesn't just suit Oliver Stone perfectly. And at this particular time, his, his kinetic uh, energy as a filmmaker and his, and his liberal hatred towards uh, 80s corporate America and the Reagan administration. What's fascinating here is that th they don't choose one way to go with this. Talk radio isn't a liberal movie that's attacking everyone on the right. Talk radio is a self-deprecating movie about a radical liberal attacking everyone because he's just as hypocritical and fucked up as everyone else. Barry, the lead character in talk radio, Barry Champlain, is unfucking likable. Seriously, this guy is a prick. He's a selfish asshole, but he's compelling. We listen to him night after night, and Bogosian's dialogue, cynicism, and fierce performance, fierce performance, drives this film home, especially with Stone's direction leading him all the way. Now, I'm a huge fan of Platoon and, and uh, JFK and Born on the Fourth of July, but it's Stone's back approach here that he's not the center of everything, that it's really Bogosian's film that it is the material, the script, and what makes everything come together, and the scale of the movie, that it all and almost entirely takes place inside of the radio station. So Stone, with this crazy camera work, makes this place feel huge and haunting. This feels more like a horror film than a drama. I swear, this is one of the most uncomfortable films you'll ever watch. Every time they do a flashback to Barry Champlain going back before he became famous, You'll have some of the most awkward, realistic confrontations you've seen with people when they actually fucking hate you. Now, apparently Stone and Bogosian didn't get along when they made the movie, but that doesn't matter because it just adds to the film's anger. A very, very angry movie about expression and individualism being lost in a society that's caught up in hearing its own voice and obsessed with each other. This film's still relevant because the people calling in wanting attention, having nothing to say, is really no different than how we are with social media now. It's just this goes back when radio is relevant. And I gotta say, it's hard not to love this film considering it takes place in Dallas, was filmed in Dallas, and I was born in Dallas, from Dallas, and that's one of my favorite cities. So for me, a Dallas local, that was pretty fucking cool every time I watched the movie to recognize the buildings and, and know what we're talking about. Also, Dallas was just a great location to pick. I think it makes it more unique keeping it away from places like, say, New York. There's just something darker and more mysterious about Dallas. A oasis in Texas. A city of, of growth, but yet despair at the same time. There's something really beautiful and melancholy about the setting of Dallas. You also see supporting roles from actors like John C. McKinley before he got famous. Uh, Alec Baldwin. Uh, John... Uh, Panko, I think it's Panko or Pankow, John Pankow. I'm a huge fan of, he used to be on that, what was that show? Mad About You. He was on that shit. Leslie Hope and Ellen Green. The film follows Barry, and I don't know if we ever actually learned the character's name outside of that, but basically Barry started off as a suit salesman. Then one day he started getting really popular on radio, and in the current timeline that we're watching in the movie play out, Barry's one of the hit radio shows in Dallas. He's the biggest show on the radio, Night Talk. And everyone locally listens to him. And he's about to sign a deal to become national. They're going to put him all over the country, and he's going to be a big deal and make the kind of money and get the kind of fan base he wants. Now, first, though, he has to get approval from the studio, uh, from this, uh, I guess, I don't know, a business guy, a suit 
I really don't know what the guy would be. I guess he was an executive for the company or something like that for one of the radio stations. So he comes that night to basically talk to Barry, right? And he's like, hey, dude, you got to tame this thing down a little bit. We got to make this a little bit nicer for everyone. And then Barry goes out and does his crazy shit, and uh, he just can't stop himself. Now, there's a lot of themes and ideas that, that the movie's looking at and a lot of things that Bogosian's trying to explore with it, especially character, um, the idea of different people having different personalities coming together and uh, the juxtaposition with that. You have a very simplistic redneck-speaking woman talking, and then you could have a very sophisticated, uh, creepy-talking older man call in, or then you could have some young rock and roller kid call in who sounds crazy, and he's really just a goofball. What I love about the film is that it builds tension by slowly getting to what the main focus of the film is about. We don't get there right away. We only get hints of sinister things going on around Barry as he gets threats sent to him, like a swastika flag, or people basically calling him and telling him they're going to fucking murder him on camera. Now, the flashbacks just give us a little bit of insight into Barry as a person and into his head. And when we want to find more complexity and depth, we just find for more of a vapid human being there. Someone who can't be a real person, someone who's a shell. In my opinion, I think Barry Champlain's one of the great movie characters simply because you can't quite figure him out. You don't know if he's a real guy when he's up there talking in the, as the radio DJ, and you don't know if he's the real guy when we see him in his home life. I mean, th th there's always a struggle. Is there a good man there, or is he just a piece of shit? We have to accept that. It's tough because you want to like Barry, but part of you always can't give into it, even though you see that there's a very loving, funny, cool guy there. There's also this very angry, misplaced, sad man there. And that sadness is all throughout talk radio. The melancholy of Barry's show Night Talk is truly one of the most haunting experiences I had as a young cinephile when I watched this for the first time at 15 or 16. Just sitting there and everyone calling in with some kind of desperation to get approval or just to have their voice heard by other people because we're so fucked up on communicating with each other that to get any kind of outlet uh, to, to speak, we go insane with it, that power to have, to have our words be heard. Barry plays into this and manipulates and mocks people for entertainment, but deep down it gets to him. It's cutting in and you see it cut in deeper and deeper. And soon the film cuts away from all the cutaways from flashbacks and flash forwards as the film has a pretty weird structure as a narrative goes. It kind of just jumps around as, as it chooses to, but it's always held together by stones consistently uh dark direction and and tone uh, stone creates a very dark tone and he shoots a very uh i'd say noirish looking uh you know dirty film it's a very grimy uh, uh sloppy film it reminds me of an old like like a 70s movie uh back to seeing new york back in the 70s or something and I don't know if Stone's ever Stone ever really felt more grounded than he did here. Sure, this is still very exaggerated, over the top kinetic energy uh, Oliver Stone that's post Platoon, you know, because for some reason after Platoon, Oliver Stone never quite found that same level of of subtlety that's in the beautiful sequences of Platoon. This film is radical, but what I love about it being radical, and this is when I was a young teenager and I was very liberal myself. I was very much on the left and I agreed with a lot of things Barry said. Um, the cool thing about Barry is that he's he's not completely right. He's very flawed and wrong in a lot of the things he says, and it feels like Stone, or at least Bogosian, is aware of that. But he's not afraid of making the character that flawed, because that way he's more real. You can't make him a hero. He can't just be a martyr. He has to be something more. Um, he has to be something that you don't want to accept as a part of, your, part of who you are. Because if you accept that, then you have to accept the consequences that come with that kind of uh, personality and, and that kind of hatred being spewed out, that kind of negative energy being spread only creates more negative energy. And you let that negative energy go through the airwaves of the radio and then that negative energy affects other people. It, it's it's really fascinating um, to, to see the emotions play out in this film because they're subtly done. The film will go from funny to sad to angry to scary and then right back to funny again. But before you know it, Stone will do a brilliant tracking shot or set up something in a room. Bogosian will give a brilliant monologue. A supporting actor like John C. McKinley will do a perfect little character beat that just makes you feel like, I know this guy. This is right. But you always get this sense of dread and something bad coming over and over again. 
and it simply builds in the film terrifically until I'd say the last half hour, you're quite simply on the edge of your seat. It's a perfect movie to watch late night on television because it's really just like listening in on a late night radio program and you going through this journey with Barry. And Oliver Stone does take you through the journey. You're right on the man's face. You never really leave him from scene to scene. And it's always so much from his point of view, or at least the film is shown in a way to give you his point of view. Not exactly that the film is presented from his point of view. I'd say it's actually a very good ensemble film and how every cast member gets to, um, you know, get, get, a, get a time to shine. And the characters are oddly all very memorable for being very small roles. I'd say a lot of it's the actors elevating the material. But once again, I think it's Bogosian's writing. He is such a good dialogue writer and so good at nailing little character beats that you're just sold on something after one little bit. And he does this in his one-man shows. He can, he can celebrate all these different types of lives and character just by saying little things. It's, it, you could go into Bogosian's whole background and all of his stuff and, and look at his post-career, which has sadly been a lot of crappy movie and television work. But this film still stands as a testament to a singular vision from a wonderful artist who would not be compromised by the Hollywood system with his first outing. This film was a low-budget film. It was only $4 million and it didn't perform well at the box office because it didn't gross its budget back. And even if it was critically acclaimed, which the film was, Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel loved it, did very well along film festivals, the film didn't get any Oscar nominations, surprisingly. Because in my opinion, Bogosian definitely deserved Best Actor. The film deserved Best Adapted Screenplay. Stone deserved a Best Directing nomination. And I'd say the film deserved Best Picture, probably Best Set Design. Hell, I'd even go so far to say it deserved Best Supporting Actress. There's so many things about this film that are terrific. When you watch it, you kind of wonder how it forgot, how it got forgotten. How it's just kind of lost in there in Stone's filmography and, and as a late 80s gem. Now, it's not that people don't know this movie, and, and it's certainly a famous play and it's celebrated, but I never hear anyone really bring this up in cinema discussion. It doesn't even have over 10,000 votes on IMDb. I mean, sure, people like it, and I guess it could be called a cult film, but you talk about a movie that needs a Criterion release, talk radio is perfect for it. Because it's one of those films where you buy the Criterion label, you'll be like, oh, okay, an Oliver Stone film, let me pop this in. And then you'll be like, oh, shit, this is why I buy Criterion DVDs. Because there's always something there to at least make it worthy of getting that. There's always something artistically uh, worth keeping around for people to see in the future. And you can learn a lot about this film. I'd say it's a better Brian De Palma film than a lot of De Palma films from the 80s. Because De Palma's genius was how he would use space. He would take a small space and make it feel huge and do a lot of genre bending and, and, and satirical filmmaking. It was very self-aware in the 80s. And I loved De Palma movies at the time. But what Stone does here is very similar. He keeps it in one location for most of the movie. But this location feels huge, larger than life. You feel like you're in one of the levels of hell. And the, it really builds to an ending that I won't entirely spoil, even though it becomes more obvious throughout the movie where it's building. But sadly, it ends on a real downer. And that downer leaves you feeling somewhat not exactly completely overwhelmed with emotion or angry or surprised. It feels inevitable what happens. So you accept it. But then you have to accept the inevitability of life, the inevitability of people. And there's something about the airwaves. There's something about the people on talk radio, what, what keeps going on, the sound, the endless sound. And it's haunting. It's haunting. Barry's story is haunting. And Bogosian's words stay with you throughout this entire beautiful little picture that I think with Stone not letting himself and his ego come in first, but letting himself serve the material as a filmmaker, which throughout his career he struggled with even now. But him serving the material here led to just pure cinema magic. And to me, this is a film that, amongst his other films, holds up much better because when you go back and watch it, you see far how far ahead of its time it was, how underappreciated it was, and how he did so much with so little. This isn't a blockbuster. This isn't even your typical art film. This is an original piece of cinema. This thing is a play brought to fucking life like few plays have ever been brought to life in a film. Bogosian is a fucking firecracker. And the power in this fucking movie that comes from him is worthy of uh, anyone who loves movies to go back and watch. Love, love talk radio. Absolutely one of my favorite films. Watch it a couple times a year. I got the DVD one time at a fucking garage sale for like a dollar. That's how fucking pathetic it is that this movie doesn't even have a good release. And no features. There's no good commentaries or special features about the making of this movie because nobody saw it. It's not fucking popular. So 
do yourself a favor. Go watch this wonderful gem from the late 80s. Uh, see, and if you haven't seen it, uh, yeah, go watch it. But if you have seen it, go watch it again. Even if you didn't like it before, trust me, there are a lot of things here that are totally worth going back to. And I think as a writer, a young writer, or a young filmmaker, you can learn a lot from this movie, especially with how to use space, um, how to have less characters. I, I prefer this old Hollywood style of film. This film feels like an older Hollywood film, just with a script that is modern and 80s. But the use of space and the amount of small characters that are, you know, and the story being told through dialogue is a very old Hollywood uh, idea. It's not a very visual movie. It's got gorgeous cinematography, but it's not a film that the shots tell you everything. It is driven by dialogue and character, and that's what I love so much about it. Sure, there's a little bit of this 80s date to it. It feels a little metal. It feels a little too Howard Stern. It feels a little too much on the left. But those are only byproducts of the decade it came from. That doesn't actually affect the core center of the film and its power. Like I said, this is one of the most uncomfortable films you'll ever watch. I feel that way every time I watch it. And it's a beautiful film, um, quite simply, about how we say things and they matter. How your words matter. Um, how words have power and words have consequences. And we need to understand that. In a world where, in a world where we think, because we're so connected, um, that we think those words lose power. But they, but they really have it. Barry doesn't take things seriously enough. And at the end... He realizes that was one of his biggest mistakes. He, uh, he, he just kind of lived off like a, like a piece of fluff. He got too caught up in it all that he, he forgot who he was. We lose the human element in, in ourselves. We lose that center of what makes us keep going when uh, we're, we're too caught up in the radio waves and we're too caught up in the movies and the celebrities and the, and the fancy cars and the politics and all this. We, we, we lose ourselves. We lose our connection with each other. And Barry's just trying so hard to connect with someone that that aching realization that he ultimately can't hits so hard for people like myself who've had that trouble themselves really feeling like they can truly connect with another human being knowing if somebody actually loves you or they just need you for that time to fulfill that love it's 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 a compromising it's an uncompromising film experience it's a powerful film experience and it's one that i think anyone who talks trash about now or, or acts like it's just some you know Oliver Stone typical liberal wank fest. Uh, I disagree. I think Stone's message was rarely told with as much clarity. And I think Bogosian was really never given such a platform to express everything that he was as an artist. So really, you got to watch talk radio. Awesome. Uh, I'm just sounding like a broken record here. But um, it's, it's truly a, a one of a kind movie. And I haven't seen something quite like it. I compare it to Martin Scorsese's The King of Comedy in the way it made me feel. But as far as a visual film, how it's executed, I don't think there's a lot of films that are quite like it. And Bogosian is such a unique character, you'll never see a movie that exactly has that balance of comedy and drama like this. Wish there had been a lot more like it. Wish Bogosian would have had a much bigger career doing his own thing, and wish Stone would have stayed with more interesting artistic projects like this instead of going to generic blockbuster fodder like The Doors. Still, uh, talk radio is, is still exists and it's still great. And we can always watch it and celebrate that one time that, uh, that stone really made something that they could hold up with platoon in my opinion. And, uh, that time that Bogosian was able to leave the, uh, you know, the, the, the New York, uh, stage scene and actually really leave a stamp on Hollywood and do something that wasn't your typical Hollywood movie. We need more films like this now, and we need more voices in cinema like this. So uh, please, Criterion, somebody, give Talk Radio a better fucking release. Seriously.